I'd like to invite you to Numbers chapter 6 this morning. My dear friends, good to see you all. Amen. Numbers chapter 6. Living in God's blessing. How many of you would love to just get a big blessing from God you're not expecting? Oh, y'all greedy folks, huh? Yeah. Amen. Well, I would too. I would too. And that's part of this message uh, this morning. I'm going to take just a second or two to give you some scriptures, and then I want to I tell you where this message come from and why I'm sharing it with you today. And I'm going to tell you right now that it may take two or three Sundays to actually preach this out, but I think it'll be worth it. Uh, I know it'll be worth it. And so you all pray for me that I will just have a clear mind and a clear heart and be able to share what God has, has put on my spirit. Numbers chapter 6, verse number 22. Number 22. And then we're going to look at a verse in the New Testament, a couple of verses in the New Testament. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, Speak to Aaron, Aaron being the priest, the high priest, and his sons took up the priesthood of the tribe of Levi. They had extremely, extremely important spiritual roles. And uh, so Aaron and his sons, I want you to say this, God says, on this wise you shall bless the children of Israel. And here's what I want you to say. And this was a formula that became very, very popular all the way up to, to still to this day. Some churches, um, you know, say this often, and they, they, this is just something, and that's okay. It's, it's a very important thing, and I want to try to open it up a little bit to you. Here's what I want you to say. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. I want you to read this with me, okay? I'll read it, so I want you to read it with me. Let's, let's pick up verse 24. Ready? The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. And then God goes on to say, they will put my name on the children of Israel. My name, my reputation is at stake. I'm going to put it on this people. And God closes out like he started. I'm going to bless them. Now, nothing was more sacred or spiritual or rich to the Hebrew culture than to live in God's blessing on their life, okay? And I mean, there's, there's no middle road here. We're either blessed or we're cursed, okay? I mean, that's just the way it goes. And to live in God's blessing meant everything to the Hebrew culture. It meant to live in the will of God. It meant to live in his favor. It meant to live where God is just so involved in your life that every aspect of your life is literally blessed. And you become a blessing to everybody that is involved with your life. And it is a beautiful, beautiful, rich thing. The word bless here, like in verse 23, the blessing of God literally means to be under the umbrella of God's divine abundance or increase in your life. Did you, did you just get that? It means to live under the umbrella of God's divine abundance and increase in your life. God doesn't want us going backwards. God wants us growing, getting more of the Spirit, more of His fullness. Uh, listen, it's, it's a sad, sad uh, 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 thing to watch a person 
used to be on fire, used to be uh, diligent with God's service, used to have a testimony. That is so embarrassing, friends. God's will is for us to start here and rise higher and to increase in all that God is. That's his will. And I hope that's the hunger of your heart and life. Am I on microphone, Chaz? I am. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm on mic that you could hear me. Now, so I want you to understand that, and I don't know about you, but I hope today that I'm preaching to somebody because this message is sort of one of these things that it's going to eliminate folks at the beginning. Okay. Um, if, if, if you're not hungry for God, this message ain't going to bless you much. I mean, if you're satisfied where you are and you don't want to be nothing more for God and you're, you know, you just want to live a peaceful little quiet life and not disturb anybody and just go to heaven when you die, I really don't have a lot to say to you today. But if there is a thirst and a hunger to experience more of God, to be more for God, then this word is for you, my dear friend. And I have to tell you, uh, this is where I am, and I want to share how this message uh, is sort of birthed in my spirit to share with you. I can't lead you where I haven't been. I can't take you where I'm not going as your under-shepherd. Amen? You all understand that, right? And so a business never goes further than its management, and a church never rises higher than its leadership. And so it's very important to me uh, who I am here at New Life Ministry to you guys. I, I, this is not, let me say this, this is not a little place for me to retire on and I'm trying to sail out for the last next decade or however how long God lets me live. This is my life. This is my heart. This is my passion. I want you to understand that. And I hope you all feel that, amen, in your own heart and life. Now, the structure of this, we're going to come back and preach it in just a second, but the structure of it, you can't see it, but in, in the written in the Hebrew, as which the old Bible was, there's three words in verse 24, five words in verse 25, and seven words in verse 26. It's a beautiful structure. It's a beautiful layout of divine increase as we walk in God. It, there's more to the Christian life than just getting saved. There's a lot more to the Christian life than just getting saved, amen? And I hope, once again, there is a hunger in your heart to just get into more of what God wants you to be involved in. Now, I'm going to read a verse out of 2 Corinthians. I don't know if I gave it to you, uh, Chess, but uh, I've marked it here, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and... Um, the last, matter of fact, it's the last verse in the book. If anybody knew the richness of the priestly blessing, it would be Paul who grew up a Hebrew of the Hebrews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he knew the richness. And it's amazing because it throws a lot of light on what I want to preach on and why this is birthed in my heart. And okay, Lord, if you want me to do it now, I'll do it. Let me just tell you, because the thought just crossed my mind, and Paul is the, the key illustrator in this message. How, how is it possible? How is it possible to do religious things and never have the desire to experience God? in them. Are y'all with me? What, what satisfaction can you find to be the most religious Pharisee and stand on the street corner and pray long, eloquent prayers? How can you be satisfied to do that and never get a prayer answered. Huh? You see, that's where Paul was. 
Paul was the guy that would say the priestly blessing and get the priestly blessing in the synagogues and never really knew the reality and richness of it. It was just formalism. But when the Holy Spirit got a hold of the Apostle Paul and transformed his life, he began actually for the first time to experience and enjoy the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you. That's why he's seen the Lord Jesus as a shining light and the presence of God blinded him. Now he knew what this blessing was because he got Jesus in his heart. How? How can a person sign a card, shake a hand, be baptized, and be content with that without ever getting the witness of the Spirit to their spirit? How? It don't make sense, does it? How can, how, how can we, you know, go to church? And do church, do a service, and be satisfied if God never shows up and we never feel his presence. I don't get it. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm different. Maybe I'm old-fashioned. I don't know. I don't even, I don't even know me. The, the older I get, the less I know me. Thank you, Norma. Yeah. <laughs> But you know what? It gets worse. Thank you, Sister Norma. I love that. I love that optimism there. Amen. But yet, Sister Norma, that's the very thing God is, wants us to learn. He wants us to learn to quit knowing us and know Him. To quit looking to ourselves and start looking unto Him, the author and finisher of our faith. That's exactly what God is schooling us on. I don't get it. And I'm not. This message, I was doing my personal devotion through Corinthians and taking my little notes and the Holy Ghost dropped this in my spirit and I put my pen down and I said, Whew, okay, Whew. I had to take a breath. Because, can I be personal at the beginning of this, you all? said, y'all going to give me the freedom for that. So, I've been really, really, really for a while now seeking God like I haven't sought him in a long time. If you're ever seeking God, he's took the initiative and he's drawing you there. I don't know where he's taking me. All I know is he's wanting more of me. And I'm learning in baby steps how to get there. And this is a portion where God has placed me, and I, and I know he wants us to be here together, okay? So I'm reading in Corinthians, and Paul came. Now, we're talking about a guy who was caught up to the third heavens, the third heaven, and gave us 13 books of the New Testament. So he wasn't a dummy, okay? He, this guy was brilliant. He knew spiritual stuff like nobody else knew spiritual stuff. But when he came to Corinth, he said, knowing all that I know, all I want to know to you all is Christ crucified and risen. Okay? Now, remember, stay with me. you got to stay with me. At Corinth, it was very popular to have these great philosophers, people you studied in school like Socrates, Aristotle, and, and all these philosophers and, and these spiritual men. And so Paul came with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he brought that message. Well, people got saved. Lives got changed. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit demonstrated himself when Paul preached. I mean, it was either right or revival. But the thing is, when Paul preached, the Holy Ghost crowned that. He blessed that. Paul was preaching and living in the ironic priestly blessing that we spoke about in the book of Numbers. And because Paul was living under that blessing, God shined on his ministry. God put his blessing on his his uh, message and people's lives were changed. 
these philosophers, these rich, these uh, brilliant men had their degrees, they had their credentials, they had the paperwork of so-and-so has endorsed me, and they would come, and they told the Corinthians, they said, look at Paul, his appearance is weekly, his message is plain, and look what we have to offer. We have these philosophies, we have this religious knowledge, we're superior to the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul basically said, na 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 you've got your credentials, you've got your knowledge, but I've got something that you don't have. He said, when I preach, when you preach, me and say, oh, how great you are, philosopher. Paul said, when I preach, people say, what a great Savior that we have. And I want to tell you, friends, Paul could tell those guys, he said, I got something you don't have. I have the presence of the Holy Ghost that backs up my preaching. And I'm going to tell you, church, we better hush about the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons and everybody else, and we better shut our mouths until we got the Spirit of God to demonstrate himself in our churches and in our lives, or we're just a bunch of big bag of winds. I don't care how much your church has got in the bank. I don't care how big your building is, how fancy your dress, or what la 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 Uh, Here's my question to me and you. Do we have the blessing and favor of the Holy Ghost operating in our ministry? Can you testify and people feel it? Can you sing and people feel it? Can you witness and people feel it? Brother Bobby, we don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. I'm not buying that. Yes, we walk by faith. How many of you like potato chips without salt? Anybody like your green beans without salt or season? No, you don't look at your countless like, ugh. It's religion without God. It's worship without the Holy Spirit blessing. It's living life unseasoned. And the world has no taste for what we have because it's unappealing. But I want to tell you, I don't care how mean and ugly and depressed this world is, I'm going to tell you something. God Almighty created humanity and there is something in every human being deep down in their spirit that longs for more than what this world can give them. And you professed to have the answer. Am I right? How can a person... We've been so ridiculed over this, but I'm sorry, I'm sticking to my guns on this because I've searched the Word of God. How, how, how can a person repeat a prayer and never get the witness of the Spirit that they're saved, how can they be satisfied with that? You know what? Encourage them, guide them, but leave them alone until God witnesses to their spirit that they're a child of God. Folks, I'm just going to tell you this morning, I hope you understand that my preaching is just plain and down to earth. Some of you who I love with all of my heart, and I'm not condemning you because I'm the guy in search. But I'm going to tell you, some of us in this room are in a dreadful position. And it affects our church. We're in a place where we're content without God all over us. We're afraid of what he'll ask. We're afraid of what people say. We're afraid of whatever. But at some point, we have to cross a line and say, Lord, I'm not afraid anymore because when I cross that line, I know that you're going to be in control now and not me. And things are going to happen. I'm going to tell you that will cause me and you some ridicule. When the Holy Ghost fell on Pentecost, they thought they were drunk with wine. And do you think the world will understand? Stand us when we get in 
the power of the Spirit. Oh, look at that fanatic lifting their hands. Uh, listen to that crazy, over-the-board religious person shouting on a Sunday morning. I want to tell you something, friend. I'm talking about when God shows up, nothing is ever the same anymore. Amen. It was a beautiful little thing. Picture, picture a father not putting his hands on his child's head. But, Norma, I'm gonna, since you things are getting worse, I need to come and lay hands on you. <laughs> they, would, they would look face to face, the priest, and he would say, the Lord bless you. He would smile and talk to Norma, the Lord bless you and keep you. It's a blessing. And, and you get chills thinking about the Lord Jesus just, just putting his hands over you. And, and parents, you, you want this blessing on your children. You want it on your grandchildren. I'd more than anything, I don't care how much money Ben and Beth make. I don't care what they do in life. All Daphne and I want for them, and this is what we've always wanted from the day before they were born. The only thing that we ever wanted is for God to favor their life, for God to touch them, for God to keep his hand on them, for God to guide them and guard them, that they will know him and experience Him and serve Him and live for Him. That's the favor of God. And I don't know why me and you ain't in hell today because God loves us and He's favored us and He put His hand on your life. Well, He deserves your praise for that. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Are y'all with me? That's the introduction. Hang on, it won't be a long sermon, whatever that means. It doesn't matter, amen? All right, now I want you to go back to numbers with me. And I want to open this up just briefly to you and I. As I said, I can't exhaust this in one sermon. Now, I don't want anybody patting me on the back. And I don't want you coming up to me and saying, and because I do this and you'll do it. But I'm just, I'm saying this. I don't want you patting me on the back and saying, Bobby, it's the world, it's politics, it's just the times we're living in. Just hang in there and just, just be strong. You'll see people saved. You'll see things happen. Okay? I'm not depressed. I'm just, I'm just starting to read my Bible and say, Lord, if you did those things then, have you changed? If the church had to have what they had to do what they did in their time, do we not need the same thing, Lord, or have we gotten spiritually past them? And so I'm just being a child. I'm putting aside books and commentaries and thoughts of men, and I'm just trying like a child to read my Bible just like God wrote it, and I'm beginning to see that Jesus said to me, Bobby, you'll do not only what I did in John 14, 12, greater works will you do because I go to my Father in heaven. And I read that, and I'm like, is that true? And right after John 14, 12, I read stuff like John 14, 13, and 14, and Jesus Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. And I'm like, Lord, you really mean that? Then why aren't I asking? Are you hearing me? How many of you, you don't have to lift your hand, but I'm just, I'm just trying to pull your heart out and get you involved in this message. How many of you would love to have a greater spirit of prayer on your life? How many of you like to have an old burden that you know somebody's going to get saved or healed or delivered because you got a burden on your heart? And we could go on and on and on this morning, and I know your struggle because that's what I'm seeking. You say, well, Brother Bobby, you should be way past where you had. You're a preacher. You've been in ministry for years. No, yeah, I've been in ministry, but I've been blinded by a lot of church stuff. And we have enough traditions to box God in. God, you live in this little traditional box, and this is as far as you can go. God, we have revival every June, and, and if you don't show up, you're going to miss a blessing, God. And so you better get our June. Oh, God forbid the Holy Ghost should break out in April, and maybe we just decide the Lord is moving. No, 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 we can't do that. 
I'm going to tell you something this morning, and you better get ready. I mean it. When you turn your life over to the Spirit of God, look out. I got to get here, y'all. I ain't never going to get here. Go back to numbers. I want to open this up just a minute. Now, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, and you think I'm over-spiritualizing this. That's fine, but I'm taking it from why. That's why I read 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Did we ever read that? We did read it? Well, I want to read it again. There it is. <laughs> this, this gentleman who wrote this under the inspiration of the Spirit grew up under the ironic priestly blessing of Numbers. But I want you to notice Paul's benediction is the benediction that Aaron gave. I want you to notice nine times out of ten, if I say, what's the Trinity or what formula were you baptized, you will say, we were baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Am I right? That's not the order here. And I think the Holy Ghost put it in this order because it matches the priestly blessing. Paul said, may the grace of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship or communion of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, be with you all. Amen. That benediction is living under the totality of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and all that God has to offer. I want to remind you of something you may have forgotten. There was a coach, and I don't remember his name, but I remember his story. And he had this little thing that he was, he loved Jesus and he was a great witness for the Lord. And he would always tell everybody, Jesus is enough. He would tell them that God is enough. God will take care of you. God is all you need. How many of you agree with that? That's right. And when he laid on his deathbed, eaten up with cancer, His pastor went to see him, and his pastor tells this story that this coach looked up at him as a dying man fixing to cross the river of death, and he looked up to his pastor, and he said what he always said. He said, I've always told everybody, pastor, that the Lord is enough, and he said, I want you to look at me, pastor. He said, I have nothing. I have nothing now. I I can't take any possessions, any persons. I, I have nothing. But the Lord is enough. And I want to tell you, it's easy to be a Christian when everything is going your way. But when you're facing eternity and you're facing the great unknown, buddy, I'm glad I have Jesus in my heart. Hallelujah. And that day's coming for me. And I'm finding more and more and more. It's like God, I feel like I'm a, I'm a piece of marble. And God keeps chipping away more and more and more, trying to get the junk off my life so he can make me look more like his son, Jesus. And brothers and sisters, that stripping down should happen in our lives. God has to empty us out before he can fill us up. And so when you, when you start hungering for God, this is just a word from the Lord. When you start hungering for God and, and you, you, you want to be more for him and more used by him, God always starts this beautiful process of, of, of just sort of slowly, gently eliminating, teaching you, eliminating things from your life. 
things that you thought really mattered in the light of finding his fullness really aren't that important. Do you understand me? And as you begin to grow close to God, you begin to see these things less and less. And you get focused on the Lord. And God is emptying you out to bring you as an empty vessel so that he can pour more of his fullness into your life. Glory to God. That's exciting stuff. Amen. Hallelujah. I got to go. Y'all just stay with me. Now, I want you to look at verse 24. Let's just take a minute here and start with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to write these down. There are two blessings in each verse that we get from a particular person of the Godhead. The first one in verse 24, we interpret through the Apostle Paul a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a coincidence the word Yahweh is mentioned three times. Why are we starting with Jesus, preacher? Because Jesus is the door. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way. The truth, what's it, what's it say? Finish it up. No man can lie to the Father. That's right. No man comes to the Father except by me. So you don't get to God the Father. You don't get the, the richness of God the Holy Spirit. You don't get their favor on your life until you come through Jesus Christ. I want you to tell yourself something. You all told me this morning before I started preaching that you really would love to have a great big blessing from God. And we've talked about people who are strangely content to do religious stuff without the crowning blessing of God on their life. I want you to tell yourself something. You want a blessing from God? Hang on, are you listening? God can't bless you. Until you give him what he can bless. Did you hear me? You got to give God that which he can bless. Let me illustrate. There was a daddy named Adam. He taught his little boys. He had, two, he had twins. Abel and Cain. And he taught his little boys. He said, boys, over there at the Garden of Eden were the angels and the sword. It's where you go meet God. It's where you go worship God. And he, he taught them, he taught them that the only way to get to God was through the blood. Okay? Because Adam and Eve had tried the fig leaf thing and it didn't work and, and an animal had to be slain. An innocent animal had to be slain. And so, so this daddy did it right. He taught his two boys how to approach God and get God's blessing. You all know the story, don't you? And Abel, being a shepherd, brought the little lamb, took a flint rock, Sliced its little throat, and the blood flowed while Abel cried. He cried because it was a picture of the vileness of his sin. But he knew it was also a picture that someday a real lamb, the Lamb of God, is going to come on my behalf. And by faith, by faith looking forward to the cross, to the Lamb of God, he brought that little bloody lamb to God, and God witnessed to his spirit of the forgiveness of his sin. And I tell you, little Abel had that peace of God. He had the joy that he had brought the right thing to the Lord, and he left church that day walking on the clouds because God had forgiven him of all his sin because it was placed on this little lamb. How many of you remember that day in your life? Hallelujah. Huh? 
Wasn't that sweet when the, you come to the Lord and he crowned your little humble believing heart with his spirit and the joy and the peace and heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Hallelujah. That's why I said earlier, how can people do all this religious stuff and go to church every day knowing that they never, ever, ever have experienced or ever feel God? And that's enough. It scares the socks off me. But the other brother, here's why I'm bringing him in here. Because you can't get to, you can't get to the fullness of God except through Jesus. And Cain, being arrogant, being proud, being re a rebel, cared not for what his father said, meant nothing to him. He didn't care about God's word, how to bring it, how to approach God. He cared nothing. All he loved was himself. And he went out in his arrogance and he gathered pumpkins. He, he gathered fall colors. He gathered vegetables. And he had, let me tell you, compared sacrifice with sacrifice, Cain's sacrifice looked uh, just magnificent. You look at, I mean, come on, come on. You walk up and you look at Abel's and you're like, ah, that's nasty. And you look at Cain's, you're like, well done, young man. How beautiful, how attractive. You'll draw a lot of church people off that. You'll grow a big crowd because yours is so beautiful. Your brother's over there. Who in the world will want to be involved in that kind of religion? It's gory. It's bloody. It's deathly. And so Cain come. He did it all. And he put his hands behind his back and he looked up to God and he said, he looked at his brothers and he said, God, this is for you. He never got God's blessing. There was no joy. The face of the Lord didn't shine upon him. God didn't smile on his sacrifice. God turned his face away and there was nothing in Cain's heart. There was no joy. There was no gladness. There was no peace. There was no acceptance. Uh, anything that God accepted it. And he got mad. He got jealous of his brother. He killed his brother. That's what religion will do for you And without Jesus Christ. Uh, can I preach now just a little bit? A religion without Jesus. You know why churches have so many problems? Uh, we've put lost people on our church rolls. Uh, we've put lost people in the pulpit we've put unsaved men in leadership positions they destroy our churches they ruin our churches because we ain't got enough sense to see spiritual from flesh anymore and I want to tell you there's a lot of canes that are running churches today and they got all this stuff but I'm going to tell you something just give me an old oak tree and the power of God and we'll have some church that's what it takes my dear friend and I'm going to tell you this morning, that's all I want. That's all I want today. And Cain, oh, Cain, how that just breaks my heart because the Bible says that he left God forever. Never went back to the old church place as Abel would come often. Cain never came back. He went out into hell, and he told all of his friends. He went and built a big city. Did you know that? But he told all of his friends, tried the church thing, tried the God thing. Didn't work. You can't get the Holy Ghost all over your life. You can't find God the Father's loving embrace until you come through a bloody, beaten, unattractive, shameful, naked man on a cross called Jesus. How can a bruised, Isaiah said you couldn't even tell it was a man. 
He had been beaten. And the crown, you can't imagine the blood and the goriness. How can a thing so ugly be so beautiful to us? If me and you don't make our worship, our preaching, our lives about Christ, the Holy Ghost will turn his face away and say, I can't bless that sermon, preacher, because there was no Jesus in it. The Holy Spirit only seals people that come to Christ. It's Jesus. Amen. He's everything. He's the heartbeat and the essence of every song, every everything, everything we do. And friends, when the churches start making it about Christ and not mammon, we'll have the crowning blessing of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is saying, Bobby, you want more of me? Then I'm going to bury you, son. I'm going to strip you down. I'm going to search your heart. And I'm going to put you away forever. If you want me to crown you, son, then you get out of the way and just be Jesus. And I will anoint that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you sing the songs we sing, if you sing it this way, you ain't going to get a blessing. But if you put your heart into worship and you get up on heaven and your worship doesn't become about you but about him, the Holy Ghost to fill you up. Well, bless God. Help me, church. Help me. Y'all see where I'm going as your pastor. My clock's running out. I'm inching up on 60 and I want to get all of God this side of heaven that I can get. Oh, what time is it? Y'all, I, I tell you what we're going to do. We're gonna, I told you we're going we're to preach this thing. Here's where the Holy Spirit wants us to, the perfect place. Are y'all listening to me? I want to give you something that is mind-boggling. Okay. The word bless, in, where it says the Lord bless you, the word bless means to kneel, literally. To kneel. The Hebrew word, to kneel. When people would, you know, come and worship, they would, can you picture yourself on your knees worshiping? I bless you, Lord. I bless you with my whole heart. I praise you. Amen? i got to thank God for this table, right? <laughs> How many of you can envision Jesus kneeling before you? I know, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, no, Brother Bobby, that's blasphemous. Okay? In Jerusalem, when you had dinner at somebody's house, they didn't have chairs. They had a table about this high off the ground, and everybody reclined, basically almost laid down. Your whole body was on the floor, and you reclined. Jesus Christ laid aside his garments and wrapped himself in a towel and knelt down to wash the disciples' feet. And Peter, no, no, Lord, you're Lord. I'm Peter. It don't, no, we got this thing backwards. And Jesus said, Peter, if, if I don't wash you, you don't have no part with me. See, Jesus was talking about something deeper. Did you get that? Amen. And that's why you love Peter. Well, Lord, from head to toe, just wash me. I mean, baptize me in your fullness. Wow. 
Head to toe. Head to toe, Lord, all of them. That's why you love that guy. I just love him to death. Makes me, first time you want to just slap him, other time you're like, God bless you, Peter. You're so who I am. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Sister Brenda, just, just picture God in the flesh on bended knee, washing dirty feet. Is it beautiful? You know what Jesus did for you? Do you know he knelt for you? Do you know the Bible says he laid aside his robes of glory? And he wrapped himself in human flesh. And he doesn't wash us with water, but Eva, he washes us with his red blood and makes us whiter than snow. And though your sins be like scarlet and ugly and vile, he washes you in his red blood and makes your heart as white as wool, as pure as Helen's sweater, beautiful and white. Glory to God, Kevin. He did kneel for you in that garden of Gethsemane. He was on his knees and his sweat was his drops of blood and he was praying for you and bless God, oh my soul, Jesus has blessed me. Hallelujah. And one day I just want to go, 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 go and just get on my knees and just a hallelujah fit. Hallelujah. How many of you right now can say, Brother Bobby, He's in my heart. I know what that blessing is for Jesus to come into my life. We call that pardon. That's the double blessing in this verse. Pardon. All of your sins washed away. Revelation 1.5, unto him that has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you know what's even better than that? And I'll be done. And we're going to talk about God the Father getting in His blessing. And boy, it gets richer and richer. And we're going to talk about getting to the Holy Ghost. See, a lot of you, Father and Son, all day. But when the Spirit, you're like, I uh, don't know about that one. That's why I said earlier, if you ain't ready for more of God, this preaching ain't for you. What about that other word that I just love so much? See. See, what's that little next word before we close out? Don't you like that little word, keep? David, may the Lord bless you and keep you. David, may the Lord, you know, is this what he says? May the Lord, of course, I'm talking to saved guys. I hope people don't misinterpret this. When I say may, may the Lord pardon all of your sins and may the Lord keep you saved. Isn't that sweet? Huh? My goodness, if I had to worry about whether I saved or lost, I'd be a mess. I mean, I'd be a mess if I had to live my life knowing if I sinned or messed up and God was done with me and he's going to kick me off the, this heaven's roll and I might lose my salvation. It, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't be here right now. But you see, 1 Peter 1.5 says that we are kept by the power of God. You see, the blood of Jesus not only washes all past, present, and future, all your sin away. He keeps you safe forever. That's why the writer of Hebrews says the Lord saves to the uttermost. It means completely, eternally. And friend, you got to understand this. You say, well, Brother Bobby, you sure some people are going to heaven? I've been watching how they live. Oh, you have? Who made you God? Huh? Who made you God? To have the right to say who's saved and who ain't. Maybe you ain't saved. Well, I know. I'm saying, well, Jesus said, beware of judging people for something. You be, you be judged for the same thing. If my salvation was based on me, be a different story. But it's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And you listen to me. The same Jesus that saved me from my sins is the one that's going to take me in the other side. Mom remembers, she's heard me tell it. 
Anybody in here, and, and, and I'll just say this because I did it. Anybody in here, and, and this is dangerous because it might bring out Pharisees and everything else, so just don't raise your hand. Anybody in here ever doubted your salvation? I have. I've doubted myself. I'm not bragging about it. But when you ain't living right, it's hard to really walk around saying, Oh, I'm saved. I'm saved. It's hard to when you ain't living right. Okay. Now, I got a place. I got a time. I know where the Lord came into my heart, but I don't want my life contradicting that. I want to be real. I want to walk it. Now, here's why I'm saying this. There are untold thousands of people right now. Some of them are in church. Some of them used to be in church, and some of them are not. But they're like Cain. There's no joy. There's no peace. There's no witness. There's nothing, nothing of God on their life. You know why? Because a lot of them aren't living in the priestly blessing of the guardianship of Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. Now, listen, I hope I'm bringing somebody out of religious bondage right now. Let me give you an example. Mom heard me tell uh, that I was working at Houchins. Grew up with this young man, knew his family. Mom knew him real well. His name was Kevin Peden. I don't know, and Kevin passed away a few years ago. He was about a year or two younger than me. One day at Houchins, it was just Kevin and I. I was closing up that night. And we was finishing up, and I just, the Spirit of God just said, Bob, I want you to just, you know, it's just you and Kevin. I want you to witness to him. And I didn't know if he was a Christian, and I went to him. I knew he had grew up in church. And I went to him, and I said, Kevin, it was up in the office in the house. And I said, Kevin, you know, slow down here just a minute. We've known each other for a long time, and it's like the Lord impressed me to just witness to you. Kevin, are you a Christian? Have you, have you ever been saved? And immediately, he looked at me, and he said, nope. He said, I'm not going to be. And it well, it really just hurt me bad. I said, Kevin, wait a minute. I mean, wow, why, why, why are you saying that? Here's what he said. Now, this is, now i got to give you the background real quick. This is a kid that grew up under all kinds of legalistic preaching that you could lose your salvation. I mean, you know, women weren't allowed to wear jewelry, pants. You can, Mom knows what I'm talking about. And they spent more time preaching saved people into hell than sinners into heaven. You understand what I'm saying? And Kevin looked at me, and I said, Kevin, wait, wait, wait. He looked at me. Here's what he said. He, it, this is exactly his words. He said, Bobby, I'm not saved, and I don't want to be, and I'm never going to be. And when I said why, he said, because I will never be able to live it. I said, can I talk to you, Kevin? He said, sure, Bobby. But he just stirred everything up in me, and I said, Kevin, I know what you grew up under, but I'm going to tell you right now, Kevin, whether you believe me or not, doesn't matter, but I'm going to tell you with all my heart, if Jesus Christ died for you and rose again, if you invite him into your life, Kevin, I promise you, based on God's word to you and me, Kevin, that the Lord will not only assist you to live it, he will guarantee you, Kevin, that you make it all the way to heaven. Are you understanding me, Kevin? The Lord will not only save you, he will keep you. And Kevin, Jesus said, all the fathers given to me, I will not lose one. And he thanked me. He thanked me. But I don't know where he's at. But friend, it's just good to walk out that door like you're walking away from the east gate of Eden. It's just good to go back out of this old ugly world knowing that I have shalom, God's peace in my heart. That my sins are covered in His blood. 
in that if you do mess up, all you got to do is tell him. And if you confess, he'll forgive you and cleanse you because he's faithful. Church, I said a lot today with the help of the Lord. But the bottom line is this. I want you to go home. I want you to join me. And I want two, I just need, I just, two or three that'll take this week and say, Lord, thank you for our church. Thank you for everything we have. But God, we want more, more of you.